Since the dawn of time, people have tried to make their food last longer and go further, like the Air Force of lunch. And what could make your food last longer than cramming together a big brick of leftover ground meat held together by eggs and breadcrumbs? And why is it so delicious? Well, today, we're serving up the history of American meatloaf. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel. And let us know in the comments below what other dinner staple origin stories you would like to hear about next. I can see paradise by the oven light. Get out your great, great, great grandmother's copy of the De Re Cucinaria cookbook and flip to the section on force meats. But if your family isn't into the habit of hanging on to ancient books, and we get it, those pop figures need shelf space, we'll give you the Cliff's Notes. De Re Cucinaria, also known by the name it shares with a famous Roman cook, Apicius, comes to us from the 4th century AD, making it one of the world's oldest surviving cookbooks. While it isn't believed that Apicius wrote the cookbook himself, he was, in his time, known as a prominent gastrometer. He was like the Copernicus of your gut, except simple dietary strategies were at the center of his solar system. He and others like him believed that a scientific attitude could be taken towards food, and they prioritized basic meals over luxurious and extravagant feasts. However, the cookbook that occasionally bears his name doesn't quite reflect the less is more philosophy, as it contains over 500 recipes that span the Roman culinary gamut, from spiced wines and crab meat croquettes to brain sausage and stuffed mice. Apicius, the cookbook, has any delicacy that a togo-wearing foodie could ask for, and some that you would never ask for. Brain sausage? Whose brain? And what do you stuff a mouse with? Cheese? Hmm, that seems rude. But we're not here for Apicius' milk-fed snails. We're looking at this ancient cookbook for one recipe in particular. In Latin, it's called Leporum Fursum, which roughly translates to English as stuffed hare. Needless to say, this ain't your granddaddy's meatloaf. The recipe calls for force meat made from hair to be mixed together with pine nuts, bound together with eggs, and wrapped in the caul of a pig. This tasty little meat tube is then placed in a wine broth and roasted in the oven. It may not seem quite like the ketchup-covered meat lump you're used to, but it's the first recorded recipe to show how you can bind meat together in a surprisingly appetizing hunk using non-meat ingredients. And as the years passed and people across Europe looked for ways to make the most out of every piece of food they could find, this recipe was the perfect launchpad for better things to come. About a thousand years later, 18th century Pennsylvania Dutch immigrants, the German ancestors of today's Amish and Mennonite communities, came to America and developed their own kind of scrap meat concoction. Back home in Europe, these immigrants were used to eating panhas, a German meat pudding made from pork and buckwheat. Only, buckwheat wasn't native to the Americas, and the Pennsylvania Dutch had to find a replacement for it if they wanted to satisfy their insatiable cravings. And find it they did. By taking minced pork and swapping out buckwheat for cornmeal, they'd simmer the two ingredients together and mold the resulting meat dough into a nice, tasty, rectangular shape. Then they'd fry the whole thing and serve it up, creating a whole new recipe for the new world. They called it Scrapple. While Scrapple's still not quite the same as our modern meatloaf, this Pennsylvania Dutch recipe is believed to be the first American marriage of meat and starch in a loafy form. Between its savory flavors, its hearty weight, and its distinguished meaty complexion, it had all the makings of a new American classic, like a Cadillac Eldorado, but generally more edible. But Scrapple didn't catch on because of the heavy workload required to mince meat by hand. Which makes sense. Cooking is a pain in the ass. That's why restaurants exist. But a solution was waiting just over the meaty, loafy horizon. Karl Dreis was a German inventor best known as the creator of the bicycle, which as far as inventions go, was a pretty good one. But Dreis was responsible for another invention that arguably saved our favorite loaf of meat and secured its future on dinner plates across America. That invention was the meat grinder. The meat grinder first came onto the market in the mid-1800s. While new meat processing inventions were sprouting up all over the world at the time, Dreis's meat grinder was unique in both its portability and its availability. For the first time ever, you didn't need a butcher to grind your meat for you. 
Households everywhere could now pulverize meat and dispose of any errant bodies all by themselves, which led to people creating new and meaty recipes all their own. In the 1870s, the first modern meatloaves began to pop up all across the United States, using whatever meat was around, usually beef, the 1870s were just lousy with it, but sometimes ham or veal. These intrepid innovators added basic seasonings and onion to their freshly ground meat. They'd mix it all together with milk-soaked bread and eggs, and voila! They had themselves a modern, delicious meatloaf. Now, they just needed to invent some gravy. However, you wouldn't find this meatloaf being served at Gam Gam's church luncheon. Rather than the dinnertime centerpiece it is today, meatloaf was usually viewed as a breakfast food or as a snack back then. Meatloaf as a snack. Man, the 1870s sound cool, except for all the other stuff. In fact, one of the first known recipes for American meatloaf, from an 1875 printing of Missouri's St. Joseph Gazette, recommends serving your meatloaf at tea time. Presumably, so you can dunk your loaf into your tea like a meaty cookie. As the 19th century turned into the 20th, meat became more abundant, and meatloaf became more abundant with it. Several innovations of the Industrial Revolution led to this increase in available loaf beef. The invention of barbed wire kept cattle from roaming wherever they wanted. Meanwhile, refrigerated rail cars allowed meat to be shipped across the entire country further than ever before. And finally, this period saw the creation of America's first industrial meatpacking plants, which would become the biggest industry in the country by 1900. But even with a historic availability of meat leading to a greater number of meatloaves being eaten, it wasn't until the country took a turn for the worse that meatloaf became an American culinary tradition. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, countless people were out of work, leaving families struggling to get by. It became necessary to learn how to stretch every dime, scrap of clothing, and morsel of food as much as possible. America went from a nation swimming in beef, like it was at an extremely specific pool party, to a harsh meat drought. Once again, the beef was hard to find. Where's the beef? Households were on the lookout for any way to make their meat last longer. And when hungry people cry out for help, Meatloaf answers the call. A smushed up hunk of beefy leftovers turned out to be the perfect food for feeding a family on the cheap, and people began experimenting with the recipe, adding in bread, crackers, oats, cereal, tapioca, basically any grains they could find, just to make their loaves a little more filling. But stuffing in all that starch dries the meat out. So households countered that problem by adding in condiments to make their loaves more moist. Popular flavor-improving additives included mustard, bouillon, and even canned soup, which is effectively just garnishing your meal with another meal. As the dish began to grow in popularity, major food brands decided they wanted a slice of that loaf as well. Recipes started to show up on the packaging of everyday products, like boxes of Quaker Oats and cans of Campbell's soup. But ultimately, Heinz Ketchup would become the brand most associated with America's beefiest loaf. It did not take long for Heinz and its 57 varieties to become synonymous with meatloaf, as its sweet, salty, savory, bitter, and sour taste complemented meatloaves better than a can of cream of mushroom ever could. America's bond with the loaf only became stronger with the onset of World War II pulling families and their favorite meal together like starch uniting bits of smushed up meat. Just seven months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the U.S. government began rationing certain types of food. This started with sugar, but it soon spread to coffee, meat, cheese, and canned milk. Citizens were granted ration points by the government, and households had to choose how to spend their points wisely. While this led to the proliferation of certain foods that were cheap to produce, like mac and cheese and pancakes, meat became a rare commodity. In fact, meat became so rare that it started to be sold on the black market, hawked by smooth-talking meat leggers. Sadly, the mental image that word conjures is an immediate disappointment, because their legs were not made of meat, although technically they were. Technically, everyone is a meat legger. Many Americans, most of whom lived through prohibition and didn't have any issue with defying governmental restrictions on their groceries, bought illegal meats from some of the nation's most dangerous criminal gangs. For those who were less criminally inclined, though, meatloaf once again rose to the occasion as a way to make scarce meat last. And soon, even more meatloaf recipes began to spring up across the nation. 
from the Culinary Art Institute's Savory Meatloaf to Penny Prudence's Vitality Meatloaf. An arms race for the best meatloaf was fought on the home front while the war continued abroad. The World War II came to an end in 1945, and with it, the government's meat rationing program. America's love of meatloaf only deepened from there. As the post-war baby boom brought tens of millions of new mouths to feed, simple dishes that could feed whole families became increasingly popular. Like casserole, which, as best we can figure, is just throwing a bunch of shit into a dish. Actually, that's not too different from meatloaf. And as women returned from their wartime jobs to domestic roles, demand grew for new and adventurous recipes to spice up life at home. Meatloaf entered its renaissance. This was its bat out of hell two stage. Supermarkets began to sell prepackaged meat combos of beef, pork, and veal that were perfectly portioned for loaves. All customers had to do was add their own preferred veggies and seasonings. And it wasn't long before advertisers got in on the fun too. And newspapers and magazines started pumping out new meatloaf recipes by the oven load. The 1955 edition of Good Housekeeping Alone had recipes for a sherry barbecued meatloaf, a mushroom stuffed meatloaf, and even a spicy peach meatloaf. Mmm, can't wait to dip that into some tea. Likewise, the 1958 cookbook 365 Ways to Cook Hamburger had a whopping 70 different recipes for meatloaf including one that called for banana and one that called for peach halves filled with ketchup. It was the loafissance, baby. You just had to be there. But as the 50s turned into the 60s and the 60s into the 70s, people stopped messing with meatloaf's formula, and the dish went back to basics. It stopped being the plaything of bored suburbanites and became a blue-collar staple once again. It soon found its way into low-cost diners, and then, tragically, developed a reputation for being bland and uninspired. No one cared for boring old meatloaf anymore. Meatloaf, meatloaf, double beatloaf. I hate meatloaf. In more recent years, meatloaf has been making a comeback, resulting in a new loafissance. It's bad out of hell three phase, if you will. Beginning in the 90s, chefs across the country started making specialty meatloaves that they could season with high prices. By the 2000s, there were meatloaves with ricotta cheese and balsamic drips, meatloaves with tahini and cream, and even meatloaves made from chorizo. Hey, rationing ended in the 40s. We can cram whatever we want in there now. There was even a short-lived annual meatloaf festival in Paxico, Kansas. But judging by its lack of online presence since 2016, it seems to have gone the way of Woodstock. Today, meatloaf is enjoyed everywhere from your local Cracker Barrel to the poshest of New York City restaurants. While it still hasn't recovered from its 1970s image issues, it's continued to be popular with experimental chefs and has increasingly found a home in diners and upscale eateries alike. Even Scrapple, Meatloaf's Pennsylvania Dutch ancestor, has had a bit of an artisan resurgence. Though Scrapple never went away in some mid-Atlantic communities, it can now be found in delis and farmers markets across the eastern seaboard. You know, so you can order it when they're out of meatloaf. So what do you think? Meatloaf or pot roast? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other weird history food videos.